good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's special colloquium. Today we have Dr. Jean-Claude Zenklusen, who is the director of the Cancer Genome Atlas, the largest cancer genomics project to date, which is a joint project of the National Cancer Institute, NCI, and the National Human Genome Research Institute, NEGRI, in the United States. Dr. Zenklusen is here in Pune, leading a team of eminent TCGA experts to the first TCGA-themed conference and workshop in India titled Multiomics Studies in Cancer, Lessons from TCGA, which has been co-organized by the Center of Translation Cancer Research, CTCR, a joint initiative between ISA Pune and Prashanti Cancer Care Mission, Persistent Systems, and TCGA. Today, Dr. Zenklusen will be talking about the Cancer Genome Atlas, Getting to Know the Enemy. Very much. So, well, oh, come on now. Wait until you hear the talk and then you decide if you want to applaud or not. Come on. Like, let's be real here. I may be a horrendous bore, okay? Uh, trust me, I'm not going to be. Uh, <laughs> so, welcome you all. Thank you for coming. Um, you may be thinking, what is this Westerner doing wearing a kurt? Well, Last time I was in India, 25 years ago, uh, we were in Delhi and, uh, for a congress. And I was about, I, I'll say, yeah, about 80 pounds heavier. I lost 80 pounds in the last two years. Uh, and I really like this because, the, oh, oh, come on, no, no, that's because <laughs> I had to. It was not, you know, it was either that or die early. So I decided to losing weight is, is good. Um, and also, my wife said, either you lose weight and you get healthy, or I'll divorce you, and I'm not <laughs> willing to do that. And so, you know, this, it's, it was not force of will or anything. I was under threat. Um, so I, 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 try, I, I truly tried to buy them, and I couldn't find anything that fit me, okay? And so my wife bought about 10 of them, and she uses them in regular fashion because they are extremely comfortable. And so every single time she puts one on, I go, yeah, and I could have one if I was thinner. Uh, and so now I'm thinner, and I saw it. I was buying stuff for the kids and, and wife today. And I saw it, and I go, hmm, maybe I can fit in it. And I do fit in it. And really, they are very comfortable. So it's kind of an homage to India, but it's really, I like these things. All right. So, <laughs> Sorry, I'm coming out of a bad cough event, so from time to time I will be coughing. <coughs> All right, so uh, as, as it was very nicely said in the introduction, uh, we are here, um, we started with a workshop trying to help people to use our data. Our data is very, use, very easily usable. But you kind of need to know what you're looking for and what you're doing. Um, and so we're, we're helping with that. Uh, we have to do that everywhere in the world because this is very complicated data. And uh, this evolved into actually a meeting in which there was discussions on should we do this in the Indian subcontinent with Indian samples? And my answer was immediately, yes, of course because the ethnic background of the population here is totally different from the ethnic background of the population in the US. And so we're all humans, one species, but we have differences. And those differences have impact in your health and how you respond to treatment and all of that. And so if we don't have the data, it's very difficult to make a model on you know, how, how the treatment should work. And so I, I, I think the project should happen I think the project will happen because there's a lot of people that are uh, involved in it. And uh, I see a fair amount of fairly young faces. So if you are thinking on a career and you're not too sure what you want to do, uh, I would suggest uh, genomics in India, okay? It's, it's, it's something that you're gonna have a lot of work for the next, I'd say 10, 15 years for sure. Um, so, why knowing the enemy? Uh, I don't know, how many of you think that cancer is our enemy? 
I think is my personal enemy, okay? I have a thing with cancer. Uh, and the reason I have a thing with, I have a thing with disease in general, but I have a thing against cancer because a very dear cousin of my mother who was about five years older than me, she was a very young cousin of my mother, who also was a chemist. She had just finished chemistry. I was starting chemistry. I got all her books, inherited all her stuff. Uh, she got married. She came in her honeymoon to India and she started coughing. And it was not this cough. It was a very deep cough. And then she goes back to Argentina. The cough wouldn't go away. And so she gets an x-ray and there it is. There's a sar sarcoma surrounding her lungs and pushing it. And she had had a thymic malignancy when she was very young and she got treated with radiation and we believe that that radiation produced the mutations that ended up transforming that thymoma into a sarcoma. Long story short, she lived inside Argentina in a, in a, in a province that was it's, it's, it's civilized, but the treatments in the capital tend to be always better than what you have in the provinces. No offense. Uh, in India, it's different, though, because you have a federated system. Argentina has more of a centralized system, so everything happens in Buenos Aires. <coughs> and so she comes to live with us because we are the, the only family she has in, Argentina, in, in Buenos Aires. She starts getting the treatments, and she goes from this very young, very vibrant, very pretty young lady, and she was very uh, so chemists, scientists normally in medium and low resource countries don't get paid a lot of money, yes? Well, we don't get paid a lot of money in high resource countries either. Uh, but it's, it's worse there. And so you know, in order to, to maintain herself, uh, she used to do um, photo shoots for L for Bog in Argentina. And so you can imagine she was really pretty. So Susanna gets sick, starts getting treatments, things don't look too well, but then at some point they get a little better and then suddenly they get really bad. The sarcoma goes everywhere, starts squeezing all her organs. Chemotherapy, very aggressive chemotherapy is given to her. She starts losing weight, incredible loss of weight. Uh, the hospital where she was treated very intelligently it's a beautiful building, but the entrance is on the first floor stairs. What happens when you're having chemotherapy and you have to go a full flight of stairs? You can't, okay? So I had to go with her because I was the burly guy. At that time, I actually was athletic. I was playing rugby. And so if I can hold the hooker in a scrum, I could hold my mother's cousin. So we keep doing the treatment until the point that holding her to get to the hospital requires no effort whatsoever from me. She was 45 kilograms when she died. She weighed less than an average adolescent. And she had a very horrible treatment time and death. Until that moment, I was going to do neurobiology. And then she dies. And I go, no, nah, this is personal. It's so personal that I have her picture in my desk. And my wife many times says, oh, while we are doing this, and I used to drag her to the hospital and sit in the front and see the people with cancer go by. And I go, that's why. And she one day asked me, why you never wonder why you are doing what you are doing? And I told her the story, she didn't know. Because she knew that I have her picture in my desk, but she didn't know why. And so I go, I have the reminder every single day. And so for me, it's a personal enemy. And if anybody has had anybody in the family that has suffered cancer, you completely understand how devastating this disease is. But in order to fight your enemy, you need to know your enemy. 
You need to know where it's located, how it ticks, how it feeds, how it lives. And until very recently, until we got the human genome done in 2003, we don't have the parts that tell us what are the important points that the tumor could be attacked. And so this is why we have the Genome Atlas, because using the tools from the genome, we started, <coughs> sorry, I don't know what's better, is to cough on the microphone or kill you with the return. It's like one of those is going to happen. Uh, and so what we are doing is using these tools to figure out with 33 different tumor types what makes the tumor sticks with the hope that we're going to get targets for therapy and we're going to be able to diminish the suffering. I don't think we will, I, I get this question all the time. When are we going to get the cure for cancer? And my answer is, anybody guesses? Never, of course, never. Why never? Because cancer is not one disease. Cancer is 300 diseases. Asking for the cure for cancer is like asking for the cure for diabetes, Alzheimer's, and dandruff all together in one, okay? It's not gonna happen. What we're gonna have is we're gonna have cures for cancer. Some cancers are going to be curable, and some will never be curable. But I hope, and I do believe, that we're gonna get to the point at which the ones that we cannot cure we can treat like a chronic disease. Basically, we get rid of whatever you have at this moment, and when the monster comes back, we'll kill that offspring. And when it comes back, because it will come back, we will figure out what that offspring looks like and kill that one. And it will be a continuous process. But if we do this and we extend your life for, say, 55 years, I think we're good. You may not be cured, but you're treatable. And so this is what we are going for. We're not saying, oh, we're going to cure everything. We can't. But curing and treating go hand in hand. All right, so what is cancer other than a horrible disease? Well, cancer comes, the word comes from the Greek, karkinos. Anybody speaks Greek here? I do. Uh, so karkinos means a crab, and it's a very strange thing to call it, but if you have ever seen a H&E and a hematoxylin eosin slide showing cancer, you have always the chunky center and then the tendrils going up. They, it, it actually looks like a crab or and a spider, if you want, or an octopus. We just chose crab because it was crab. Um, and so, because they are infiltrative, one of the things that many, 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 many people believe is, and it's wrong, uh, is that cancer happens because the cells divide faster. Yeah? In some cases, it is. You know, the cells are dividing faster, and so you get more cells in the cellular compartment than what you should have. All right? That's a tumor. Not necessarily cancer, but it's a tumor. But you also can have a tumor because the cells don't differentiate, okay? Don't change from the active state to the inactive state, okay? Let me see. I'm going to be gross here. Uh, you probably can see them. I have a skin tag here, yeah? No, you cannot see it. I have a little wart in here. That's a tumor. The skin is not supposed to do this, yeah? like uh, the, the witch's big <laughs> word, that's not supposed to happen, okay? That's a tumor. You have more cells in that compartment than what you should have, correct? Is that tumor going to kill you? No. Is it ugly? Yes, it is. It's going to kill you. No, it's not going to kill you, okay? So there's a difference between a tumor and cancer. Tumor is an excess of cells. Cancer is an excess of cells that will become dangerous, will become something that can kill you. 
as I said, it arises as the result of uncontrolled growth of certain cells or because the cells that are supposed to die and transform don't die and transform and continue in that active format. For example, in the skin, the basal cells of the skin divide every so often. And so you start with one basal cell that gets into two. One of them gets tagged for differentiation, meaning it starts producing a lot of keratin. Keratin is what basically makes our skin impermeable. Keratin is also what makes my beard. I was going to say my hair, but I have none, so uh, my beard will be a good example. Your fingernails, okay, that's all keratin. So the basal cells start accumulating keratin. They flatten and they move up from the basal layer up. And then, you know, when you do this, there's a million cells that go by, all right? We keep producing the cells because every single time we do this, the cells are shred, okay? And so you need new cells. There's one type of tumors called basal cell carcinoma. Actually, it's a slower dividing tumor than the regular skin. But what happens there is that other cell that needs to differentiate, it doesn't. And then you start having an accumulation and they can actually be quite deadly. They are very, very, very rare, but they can be quite deadly. So I kind of went through this. Um, cancer is the natural end of any multicellular organism. Any organism that is not unicellular produces tumors. And any organism that produces tumors eventually will produce cancer. So one of the things that I hear sometimes is like, oh, cancer is kind of a new thing. You know, in the Middle Ages, they didn't used to have so many cancers. And my response is like, uh, you are totally cuckoo crazy. Uh, the problem is in the Middle Ages, most people died from Horrible water gives you cholera, okay? All the viral infections, all the infective diseases, wounds at the crusades, you know, fires. You need to actually live a significant amount of time to develop cancer. Cancer is, for the most part, a disease of old age. And so if you don't get to old age, yeah, congratulations, you could cure cancer, okay? <laughs> Kill everybody at 40 and the cancer incidence will go, ooh, ooh, okay? Not a solution, but it will explain the numbers, okay? But we know that cancer existed at those times, although people did not call it cancer. Um, there's a very famous statue of the Emperor Augustus. Augustus died from colon cancer. Uh, that shows, you know, his belly, and the, the, the Romans were not flatterers, you know. If you had a bulge here, they put the bulge there in your statue. And, and there's a very famous statue of, of Augustus on his old age that he has a big, chunky protrusion happening here, and that was his colon cancer. That's what killed him. Killed him at 86, okay, because it's an old age thing. Leukemias tend to be of earlier ages, and so we have a lot more reports of leukemias. Anybody knows what leukemias were called in the Middle Ages? <coughs> so ladies in the Middle Ages, normally noble ladies, because peasants couldn't because they had to work, okay? But noble ladies in the Middle Ages sometimes contracted melancholy. <laughs> they, they, they had no strength her skin was pale, it looked translucent. Well, I have some news to, for you. You have leukemia, okay? That's, that's, the defini that's the definition of the symptoms of leukemia. It's just that they didn't know that that what it was. So cancer has accompanied us all throughout evolution. And as I said, it's, a, it's an old age disease because you have to accumulate between six and seven mutations in very particular genes, <coughs> not in any gene around, okay? They have to be in very particular genes all together in a single cell. So that is probabilistically something fairly rare. 
but the longer you live, the more chances you're gonna have to have these mutations happening in a single cell. And so that's why cancer is a disease of older age, okay? And older age always gets defined as older than me, <laughs> okay? We never consider that we are old. It's like people that are older than us are old. Uh, but yeah, at some point we reach the point in which you are at, at, at risk. There are, as I said, about 300 distinct types of cancers and subtypes, and they can be found in specific organs. And each of one, one of them is, is a little different from the other. And so that's why we are doing the atlas, because we need to look at many, 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 many cases to see what are the things that are important and that are causing cancer. This comes from a fairly old paper, as old is defined in science. This was published in 2001. It's called The Hallmarks of Cancer. It was a review by two very well-known persons, Feinberg, uh, Weinberg and Feinstein. Uh, and what they said is, you know, there are certain functions that the cell need to deregulate in order to become carcinogenic. And then they revised it later on with, with details, but this is pretty much it. So the cell needs to, let me see, I do the right thing, needs to proliferate, needs to divide. If you don't divide, you're not going to have more cells than you need. And so you need to do that. But also, when the cells start dividing and they are dividing where they're not supposed to divide, the rest of the body receives those signals and says, hey, 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 hold a second. Okay, you're not supposed to do that. And the cells around start sending signals to tell it to stop that. Okay? And so what these cells need to do is acquire mutations that make them deaf to those signals. Okay? You can shout as much as you want, I'm not going to hear you that. Basically what happens is the receptors for the inhibitors get blocked. For those of you, oh, I didn't ask this question. How many of you are, consider yourself scientists? Okay, so I'm giving this talk at the right level. Uh, I hate to bore people telling them things that they already know. Uh, and so receptors, which are molecules in the membrane normally, of the cells are the ones that communicate the messages. And so if the message to stop growing comes through a receptor, mutating that receptor, making that receptor not able to listen to the signal, makes that signal useless, okay? The other thing you have to do is you have act to activate invasion and metastasis. And this is the most complicated of all the processes because this is very tightly regulated. Cells are not allowed to move around in the body. A liver cell cannot say, I am so tired of this neighborhood, I'm going to move somewhere else. It can't, okay? If it's a tumorigenic liver cell, eventually learns to do that, okay? And the important thing is why the tumor cells will move to another location. Because they could invade, basically, you know, break the barriers around the organ and keep growing, which they do frequently. But why would they pack and leave and move to another neighborhood? Okay, why would you move to another neighborhood in your life? You're living in neighborhood A and you decide to live to neighborhood B. Same city, didn't change work. Why would you do that? Anybody? Hmm? Better housing, nicer schools. Yeah? It's a nicer neighborhood. So I want to live there. In here, I cannot have a swimming pool. Down there, I can. Well, the cells do exactly the same thing. If you look at where metastasis happens, happens to majoritarily three places. Your liver, your lungs, your brain. Why the liver? What happens in the liver? All the sugar gets processed. 
So you have as much food as you want. All you can eat. All right? What happens in the lungs? You have oxygen that you need in order for the processes to work. There's no place like the lungs for oxygen, except the brain. Because the brain is the favorite child of the body. Whatever the brain wants, the brain gets. Okay? And without having to toss a tantrum. Because the body knows what without the brain, there's no body. <laughs> okay? So it may be a brat, it may be annoying, but we have to feed it and give oxygen. You know that the last thing that dies in your body is your brain. Because as your body shuts down, your blood vessels close down except the ones that go to the brain. The heart pumps as much to the brain as possible until the absolute last second. And so if you are a tumor cell, which neighborhood do you want to go to? The problem is getting here is quite complicated. Okay? It happens because they do, but it's quite complicated. So this process is a very long and very complicated process, and not all tumors produce metastasis because of that. All right? Then you have enabling replicative mortality. I hate scientists. So, fine. Enabling, allowing. Okay, that word. Replicative immortality. What is replicative? Replication, division, yes? Immortality, they don't die. Well, couldn't they put cells don't die? Okay, so common language will be cells don't die. Scientific language will be enabling replicative immortality. Oh, for heaven's sakes, speak in a common language. All right, so, but that's what happens. The cells become immortal, okay? They just don't die. They don't differentiate, they don't die. Uh, does anybody know the story of Henrietta Lacks? Everybody knows the story of Henrietta Lacks now. If I had asked this like seven years ago, nobody would have known who Henrietta Lacks is. Do you know the cells he, la? These are the cells from Henrietta, okay? Um, these cells are absolutely mortal. There's no way to kill them, sincerely. You can put them in water and give them no nutrients. The darn things will keep living, okay? They, they are, there's no way to kill the things. They're so pervasive that some years ago, a very famous repository that collects a lot of cells got into trouble because they were shipping vials of different cells with different names, and they were all Gila. They didn't know it. The culture just went out of bounds and contaminated half of the collection, okay? So these are horribly resilient cells, and they're cancer cells, all right? Inducing angiogenesis. I said that the tumors need to be fed. Angiogenesis is the process by which you produce new blood vessels. I know, he could say produce new blood vessels, inducing angiogenesis. Let's see. Once you finish growing, when do you produce new blood vessels? We don't. Unless you get hurt, you get a cat bleeding, new blood vessels to close the wound. That's the only type it happens. In males, it never happens unless we do stupid male things, okay? Get hurt ourselves. In females, normally happens once a month, okay? Because you have this big injury that is happening to you and it needs to be fixed, okay? So we never, the ladies, have the misfortune to have to do that once a month. The tumors are growing bigger than the cellular compartment. The body will feed that cellular compartment with enough food and oxygen for what it's supposed to be doing. Well, now there's a lot more cells there. There's not enough blood and oxygen going. 
what do the tumors have to do? Call in more blood, and so they get more oxygen and more sugar, and that's angiogenesis. In fact, this is also a big <coughs> barrier because what happens is you get a tumor that never becomes cancer. Why? Because it can never invade. And why it can never invade is because it cannot call the blood vessels. It never learned to call the blood, the, the blood vessels, and as such, it cannot grow any further because it doesn't have the food. Okay? So remember the word. The words don't transform into cancer because they cannot call the blood vessels, and so they cannot grow any further than what they did. All right? So every single tumor has the potential to get there, but it needs to learn these things. <coughs> Sorry. And the other thing is resisting cell death. Some cells differentiate, some they'll just explode because after they do a certain amount of work, they're programmed to go away, okay? It's called also cell suicide. Uh, like it's, there's an intention, there's no intention. Uh, and so a tumor cell that wants to be immortal cannot be, well, maybe it could. Well, yeah, it, it could be a, like a zombie cell, die and resuscitate. But uh, no, once cells die, they die. You know, zombies don't exist, uh, I think. Uh, so they need to evade the cell death in order to accumulate and be mortal and all of that. And so all of these things are very important for a tumor to learn to do. How you do it, though, is not the same way for every single tumor. Some of them may learn to do the replication first. Some of them become deaf, deaf to the signals that says not to replicate. You know, these things happen randomly. Uh, we have the saying in English, there's many ways to skin a cat. Cat, skin, okay? There's many, many ways to get a tumor. And, and, and those change according to what luck or bad luck did you have and what mutations did you accumulate where, all right? So all of these things have to happen, but they don't necessarily happen in any particular order, and, and, and it may take a long time for them to accumulate in a single cell. There's, there was, there's not anymore, but, but people still think of, the, of cancer these ways. Cancers could be thought as cancer cells in a compartment and nothing else, okay? That is what we call the reductionist view. And then there's the real view, which is cancers are the heterotropic cancer cells plus the new blood vessels that they call, plus the new fibroblasts that are trying to do a matrix around, plus the immune cells, because your immune system is going to go, what are you doing here? And go and invade. And so you have all these things going together. And one question that I get very frequently is, if the immune cells go to cancer, why does the immune system not take care of cancer? And my answer is, in fact, the immune system takes care of very early, very small cancers very efficiently. Uh, the problem is, some of these cancers become very aggressive and they start growing very fast and the immune system cannot catch up. But also what they learn is to produce one molecule that tells the immune system, I'm not here, these are not the droids that you're looking for, okay? The Jedi mind trick of cancer. And it's like, pay no attention to me. Have you heard of immunotherapy for cancer? Yes. You probably have. Well, what immunotherapy for cancer does is just take that molecule that does the mind trick and we have an antibody against it and you close it and now the mind trick doesn't work anymore because you cannot signal the immune system and the immune system attacks the tumor. Does it work for every single tumor? No. It works only for the very, very, very bad ones because the very, very, very bad ones have so many mutations and are producing so many proteins that are not correct that the immune system goes, what the, and gets rid of it, okay? And so it's, it's funny because we have been saying for eons, the best solution for cancer is early detection, which it is. 
but an early detected tumor is not a candidate for immunotherapy because an early detected tumor is not a very, 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 very bad one, okay? And so, you see, treatments have to change according to what the enemy looks like. And that's what the Cancer Genome Atlas tried to do. This is something that I normally show, and this is so out of date, it's not even funny, uh, to show how much we have advanced in, in, in the past 20 years. So I got my master's in chemistry in, oh God, when was that? Uh, 91, okay? And I got my PhD in 95. And when I started my PhD work, we knew this little thing here in the middle. You see, P16, no, P16, not even. Cycling D1, RB, E2Fs, and then uh, ARF, no. P53, uh, we knew FOSS, we knew MIC, we knew June. That's that. Okay? That was what we knew about the cell machinery because we had not had the, the cancer, the, the, the genome project. So we didn't know really what the genes were. We knew what the functions were and many things were named after function. So if you did protein chemistry in the olden time as I did, you knew functions of things that happened because there was a cycle that was producing metabolites. So we have uh, fumarate dehydrogenase. That means it's an enzyme that takes fumarate and takes an, a, a hydrogen out of the fumarate. Did you know what was the gene? No. We didn't we know what was the structure? Heck no. We only knew that there was a function, but we didn't know what was doing it. And so the genome changed all of that because that now we have the full sequence and we can tell, ah, ha, ha. So this is the area that is producing the function. This is the area that is regulating the enzyme. So we knew these enzymes, but we didn't know what they look like. Basically, we knew that the Earth had continents, but we were not too sure of the shape of them, all right? And so what the Genome Project did was send De Soto and Magellan and everybody out there to explore, and then they come back and they go, oh, it looks like this, okay? That's exactly what the genome did for us. This Graphic is, yeah, 2001. Uh, and you see there's a lot more genes going there because by now the genome is going, it's not finished, but we're getting a lot more information. If I show you the graphic today, it's what we call, and this is a scientific term, the ball of yarn. I kid you not, this is a scientific term. We call it the ball of yarn because you look at, the, at that, you know, relationship map, and it's a ball of yarn. It looks like a cat went to the yarn and went crazy. There's so many lines there that you cannot tell who's who, what's what, where they are. We have 23,000 plus genes. So put them all in there, and you have a ball of yarn, okay? But when you need the ball of yarn, because if you don't know what are the different connections and what do they look and what the genes look like, you cannot tell what are the actors that are producing the tumors. And so we needed to wait until the genome was done, and that was in 2003. Uh, oh, that's a nice picture. Uh, and, and by 2003, we had the genome, and then we decided to start trying to figure out what of these players work in cancer. And why did we try to do that? Because... And, uh, Clinical oncologists normally don't like me when I say this, but then again, people don't like me for the fact that I wake up in the morning and I'm still breathing, so heck. <laughs> the traditional chemotherapy is like a game of darts played at an Irish pub where everybody that is playing is blindfolded and it's an Irish pub, so people are <laughs> drunk, <laughs> all right? And so you have people with very pointy objects who don't see where they are aiming, and they are not too steady, trying to hit a little round thing, and if possible, in the middle. What's the chances of that happening? 
very low, okay? And this is exactly what happens with the traditional chemotherapy. We are using drugs that are not selective. Drugs that kill every single cell that divides. Let me see. That will be all the cells in your body. <laughs> it is. Every single cell in your body will divide at some point. And so the way we do chemotherapy is we give that these, these horrible things poisons that are regulated because they're poisons, okay? We give these horrible things for a short period of time because if we give it for more time, we kill the patient, okay? So this is a chicken game, you know, like chicken in with racing, street racing, to see who, who, who blinks first. It's like if the patient dies, well, to start about, we can do it. If the tumor dies, whoo, it's like, Give me a break, that's no way to treat anybody, okay? Not even my worst enemy, and I have a lot of them. Uh, and so what we are trying to do now is take the blindfold, give some coffee to the players, so they transform into the championship dart thrower. This guy is a Dutch guy whose name I don't know, but they tell me he's amazing with darts, okay? I, I trust them. That's the whole goal of this, okay? Is give you information because the people that are playing blindfolded and drunk don't hit the target, not because they're bad at throwing the darts. It's because they don't have the information or where the target is. And so this is exactly what we're trying to do with the cancer genome atlas. They give you the information. So how did this happen? Uh, in 2005, there was a presentation to our bosses at NCI, which is the National Cancer Advisory Board, saying it would be nice if now that the genome is done and we have the tools, if we apply the genome to cancer. And the answer was, yeah, great idea, how much it's going to cost, and we go and uh, we don't want to tell the number because it was atrociously high. Uh, and so they say, well, <laughs> you will start with a couple and we'll see if we can do it because the technology was very, very, very new um, and very expensive. Oh, by the way, you know how long it took us, and when I say us, I mean me and my colleagues, to do the genome? I postdoc in the lab that did chromosome 7 map, so I was part of the genome. Um, how long did it take? Anybody knows? 13 if you count the fixing. The first draft was about 10 years. You know how much money? Three, count them, three billions of dollars with a B. Okay, so 3,000 million dollars. One genome. But that's because you do it for the first time, okay? So the first time you do it, you're not that good at it. Whatever you're doing, first time you do it, you're not that good at it. And so we needed to figure out how it happened. And so it was very expensive. It became cheaper. But by the time we started TCGA, one whole genome cost still about a million bucks. 500 samples at a million buck each, and this is just one plot. No, nah, that's not going to happen. And so what we had to do is a very reduced scale uh, project, but the reduced scale project proved that it could be done and that we were going to learn new things about it. When we started the genome, we thought that you have five to six, you know, I put six to seven mutations there, and then it's gonna be the same mutations over and over, of course, because all the tumors look the same. Um, and so once we figure out what the five or six genes are, ta-da, we're golden. Uh, we did GBM, and I started receiving the data because I was working in GBM. And I start looking at the data, and I go, there must be something wrong here. Because we were not finding six or seven genes that were really highly mutated. Nah. They were like 2%, 5%, 10%, 12%. 
ah, we got really scared. Because we go, okay, the model doesn't work. But then we started looking at, instead of genes, at functions. And these genes that were mutated are not at very high levels. They all accumulated in three functions, three cellular functions or pathways. And that's why it makes sense. It's not the gene, it's the function that gets altered. Remember hallmarks of cancer, Weinstein, five, they had it. It's functions, it's not genes, okay? But until that moment, we thought that single few genes were going to be the problem. If I say this today to cancer biologists, they laugh me out of the room. But when we started, that was the model, okay? So that's one of the things that we learned, and we learned a lot more other things. And so, 2000, late 2008, we published the first report, and in late 2008, do you know what happened? October of 2008, the financial system went poof, yeah? And the US said, we cannot let the financial system disappear because we did that in the 30s, and it took us 25 years to get out of it, and a world war, so it's not a good idea. And so they put a lot of money back in the system, and they put a lot of money back in the system through projects that were ready to go. So basically, the federal government decided, we're gonna go to town, spend like drunken sailors, but we're gonna spend like drunken sailors on bars that are already open, okay? We're not gonna try to build a bar. And so one of the bars that was open was TCGA, and it needed a lot of money. And so that's when we got a boatload of money, and we went from the two pilot projects to 25 originally, and as we kept doing the, the work, the systems became better and cheaper, and so we ended up doing 33 tumor types because we had the money for it, all right? It took us until 2016 to finish the analysis. Generation of the data at the beginning was the complicated part, then it became simple. Again, you do the things enough times and you become good at it. Analysis, the tools were not there. So computer scientists had to start putting all the algorithms together that gave consistent results. Consistent results as two different centers analyze the same file and give you the same results, which was not trivial originally. In fact, it didn't happen originally. Uh, and so by 2016, we had basically all the tumors that we were funded for, and we did the analysis, and we had the publications, and then from 16 to 18, we work on all the data that we had, and we produced what is called the pan-cancer analysis, all cancers together. And that showed that cancers do have things that are common to all of them, but they have a lot of things that are different among them. And so we have learned a lot, but I think the most important thing is that all the data that we have produced is publicly available. Let me define publicly and available. Publicly as anybody. And when I say this, people go, yeah, but you need permission. No, you don't need permission. Our data is open to anybody. My mother heard me say this once and it's my mother. So she tried to prove me wrong. And so she asked me, where is the data? I sent her the link. She's not the most technically savvy person, okay? Her VCR for 15 years, blank 1200, okay? She couldn't put the date, uh, the, the hour on that thing. She went online, went to the system, and started clicking randomly here and there, asks for the results, and ta-da, here they pop. And she goes, wow, you're right, it is available. But available also has to be usable. And at the beginning, our data was not usable because you had to download the data. And it's a very big chunk of data. Uh, well, no. Uh, this is not relevant for you guys. We did a lot of platforms, and so a lot of platforms produces a lot of data and a lot of data is difficult to download. 
Don't you hate it when you are away from Wi-Fi and you are trying to stream YouTube and this damn thing is going like, I don't want to see this. I want to see what I want to see, yeah? And that's a very small file. These things are huge. They are so big that at the beginning, the internet was not fast enough. We could not transfer through the internet. Federal Express, I always say, got really, really rich with us because we had to ship samples here and there, but also we had to ship hard drives with the data from the centers that were producing it to the centers that were analyzing it. And, and when I say hard drives, I mean hard drives, okay? Racks this tall, this wide, and that wide, full of hard drives every single day of the week, all right? Now you actually can download the entire thing because the internet is big. If you have a 10 gig line, it takes you about four months, continuously. It's that much data. Okay, so downloading the data doesn't work. It's not usable. And so what we did is we created an interface that allows you to do the query online without having to download everything. And then when you get to whatever you want, you can download that and, and we're all fine and dandy. What data did we have? We have RNA data, we have DNA data, we have copy number, which is something that when you have alterations in the chromosomes that contain DNA, you may have more copies of a certain fragment or less copies of the first certain fragment. And that is very informative to know what genes are being hyperproduced, why, what genes are being deleted because they're, they're not useful for the, for the tumor. And so it's, it's, it's a good measure. So we have all of that. We have the regular histology images. Do you, okay, who knows what a histology image, image is? Oh, I'm in trouble. Um, a histology image is a, if a little slice of the tissue that gets fixed in, in paraffin, in, in wax, and then it gets stained with something to see the different cells. And so we have all the images of all the tumors. Um, and so that was good. Right now we are adding something because it became cheaper. And so right now we can do a whole genome for about $1,000. And so now we're doing the whole genomes of everything because we know that there's more data there that we don't have. And so it's not enough that you have to wait four months to download all the data. Now we are going to add so much more data that actually is going to take nine months for you to download all the data. The whole idea is don't download the data, okay? Use it where it is. Don't take it home. Why do you want it home? To put it under the bed. No. <coughs> okay. So we had a network of partners. It's, it's very funny because when people come and visit my office, they expect to see, you know, all these sequencer and computers, and the only, thing, the only things that they see are small personal computers and stack of paper. Because nothing gets done at NIH itself. The things get done in different places around the country and around the world right now. What tumor types we did? Well, we did 33. The big one down there is breast cancer. The little one down here in blue is this fused large B cell lymphoma. They're all red because we're done. We did them, okay? The ones that are checkered are because there are rare tumors. That's the second phase of the, of the project. That one that is in blue, any guesses? Blue in English also describes what? Sadness. And we were sad because we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it because you see how little the bar is? It's a very tiny bar. It's only 82 samples. Not enough for diffuse large piece of lymphoma. Why don't we get only 82 samples? Anybody guesses? Because people didn't want to give us a diffuse large piece of lymphoma. Okay, it's a lymphoma. Remember, lymphomas are early stage. They're easy to produce because you don't need that many changes. Diffuse large piece of lymphoma is the most common lymphoma. Do you think that there's not that many cases of diffuse large piece of lymphoma? 
Yes or no? No, there's a lot of them. You know why we didn't get them? Because thanks to genomics, diffuse large B cell lymphoma was the first tumor type that was well characterized. And with very primitive tools, we were able to separate the lymphomas into two groups that are very different from each other, but have a very particular change, each one of them. And there are therapies for each one of those changes. So today, I would say, if you are going to have any tumor, and you get to choose which one you want, get a diffuse large visa lymphoma, thank you. Because we can cure you. Like this, we can cure you. 95% of diffuse large B-cell lymphomas get cured in one single treatment regimen. One. One week of drugs, and you're done. Go home. I don't want to see you ever again. You're cured. Trust me. You're cured. Okay? This is one of those that we can cure. So that's why it's blue. We couldn't do it. And sometimes people say, it's like, oh, that's sad. And I go, no, that's magnificent. I want all of this to be blue. OK? And this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to completely blue, everything out. And I keep talking, and I don't know what time it is. OK, of course, I'm talking over time. But this is exactly what we are doing and why we are doing it. All the other slides talk about a lot of technology things. <laughs> doesn't matter. All right? And with that, I thank you for your attention, your great questions, and your patience with me. Thank you.